good morning, everybody. Um, we are very glad that you spent the next round about 90 minutes with us instead of, you know, going for a hike um, or biking to the office, hopefully. Um, we're also really uh, excited that we have a, a very dedicated um, and, you know, very interesting uh, group of people today with us. Um, so without uh, further ado, uh, I'd like to kick it off um, by inviting uh, Katarina Gera uh, to the stage. Um, Katarina is one of the leading figures uh, in the let's say blockchain and finance space, uh, certainly. Uh, so she's a thought leader uh, and also a, a product or commercial leader if you want. Um, but let's dive into this first um, fireside chat and we will talk about what are the building blocks for green financial products and um, how um, do we get there basically. So Katarina, glad that you could make it. It's been a long, uh, let's say, first half year, I think, for everybody uh, with Corona, um, uh, especially uh, with the home office situation. Um, so it has certainly been, let's say, not the easiest time to launch new products, new services, or even new companies. Um, you are not only uh, CEO of Immutable Insights, but you also have put out new fund products. So maybe you start by uh, telling the audience, what are you exactly doing? Um, in the market, and uh, then we um, continue to to ask about your motivation and our motivation to do all of this. So, welcome, Katarina. Thank you very much, Sebastian. It's my pleasure to be here this morning, particularly an early morning fireside chat, as it's uh, special, uh, especially intriguing. Yeah, tonight we have football, so we can't do it tonight. We have to do it in the morning. And I wouldn't have had so it's uh, it's perfect now. No. Well, good morning, everyone, um, to wherever you are. The key um, for us and also for me personally is that we believe in blockchain as the infrastructure of the future. So um, the whole idea about token economy and also the industrial application, which we'll cover later, is something that is in our focus. My company um, that I've co-founded with um, to dear friends by now um, is focusing on real-time analytics for blockchains and the key idea is that whenever you use a blockchain you generate more insight and thereby more value from using that type of data and generally we do that in three areas we have asset management so um, as you briefly mentioned we're um, having the blockchain fund as our professional investor product we've already announced two retail products with crypto best and sustain liquid, something that will actually have an edge to also what we're discussing later. And later in the year, we'll also um, bring, um, let's say, more tokenized um, and even more ESG type products. So that's the first business part. The second business part is anti-money laundering and fraud prevention, where we do all kinds of analytics as a service businesses around the idea of preventing money laundering. And the third one is, and that is uh, the best handover then to what we're discussing today, industrial analytics. So whenever there's a blockchain, but without the crypto coins and the crypto trading part, when it's used as an infrastructure for production processes and for interacting with third parties, then that's something where we also apply our analysis from marketing through um, finance and risk management all across the value chain. Perfect. Thank you for, for that overview. If we look at um, industrial tokenization and the status of the market uh, right now, it's still early stage, of course, but um, you know, with a bit of oversimplification, uh, we can differentiate two bigger strands here. So one type of companies are looking at tokenization as a means of, uh, let's say, new forms of finance. And the other ones are rather looking at tokenization, you know, to 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 get out new products or to um, further digitize their their processes. Um, so, looking at what you do, um, despite the third basket you were mentioning, uh, the starting point for you has been, let's say, using tokenization to to drive. Um, f finance. Could you quickly um, let us know, you know, what, what motivates you? Um, what's the, let's say, long-term view? Um, because I think that's that's true for you and also what we are doing at Ritland Code. 
you know, the, the ups and downs of the crypto markets are, are fascinating to watch. But of course, you know, that's, that's maybe not where the biggest value will be created. So what's driving you when you get up in the morning? Well, um, first of all, I'm really grateful that for once in my professional life, I have a topic that I feel so passionate about uh, that it really is easy to get up in the morning and work on it every day. So to me, the whole idea about token economy really makes the difference because it is, um, when I say um, token economy, I mean the whole breadth of tokens. And maybe we can come to that later because particularly when we talk about tokenization, it's so important to differentiate what actually all those tokens can be and what potential they have. But the whole idea is that I think we've come to a phase in the internet and digitalization where we realize that there's still blind spots that we, for one reason or the other, can't cover. And to me, blockchain then is the infrastructure of the future and it's simplifying a lot of things. And to most people that's counterintuitive, but if you think about it, a shared common infrastructure that's safer and that's easier to share with um, anyone from a company to a client to a machine is something that first and foremost simplifies things. And if you think about what simplification and a higher level of security usually does, then that means there's predict productivity gains in your business models and thereby a whole new um, economy uh, being created. And that is what I think token economy does. And to me, that is like a, a white blank canvas where we all can start with all our um, creativity, with our drive and without, without our you know, commercial sense to develop models. Very similar to when in you know, the early 90s, somebody had a browser and then there was something like an HTML standard. But really what is what you can do with those web pages? What type of business opportunities and improvements of services can you create? And that's really the exciting and intriguing part um, of this stage in, in the process where we are with blockchain. Okay, great. Um, if, if, if you look at the market right now, or what has been your, um, let's say, point of orientation? Were you looking at, let's say, existing green finance uh, products? Or are you really building it on top of your, let's say, deep blockchain expertise that you have and, and use with uh, immutable insights? Mm. Well, let's take one step back and i think to get this out of the way for all of those people that have a question mark hanging above their head hold on you know this blockchain and energy consumption and bitcoin thing i've always heard that that's a bad thing and that doesn't work so maybe let's get that out of the way first because that will you know found the baseline yeah. why i think actually quite the opposite is true now when you look at bitcoin and the whole idea of how much energy does bitcoin i.e the coin and the network um, use, then we need to first um, acknowledge that there are three things which we're actually adding. The production of the coin, i.e. the mining, the transfers, the transactions of the coin, and the storage of all the transactions, because that in sum is what the network and the coin does. And the beauty about the network is in the transparency of distributed computing is that you can actually, you know, create that sum and have an overview. Now, with existing finance, you can't do that. Um, you don't know as a consumer how much energy is being used if you're transferring 10 euro from one place to another. You also don't know that when you buy a share, not from the investment process, but also not from the underlying, from the production. So when we look at studies, for example, from ARC management, we can quickly realize that not only is Bitcoin already much better than gold, but most likely by you know, a factor above 15, um, also more energy efficient than Bitcoin. Now, uh, sorry, so Bitcoin is more energy efficient. But now we come to proof of stake and newer consensus, mechanism, consensus mechanisms. And there, one clear, um, um, one clear argument, and that's something that I hold very, very um, true, is if you use proof of stake, you have roughly 1% of the energy consumption of Bitcoin. So by all standards, whatever you think about Bitcoin, it's clear that with the proof of stake consensus mechanism and probably even you know, additional ones that will follow with a structural reduction of energy consumption, that's massive, it's 99%. So when you look about finance right now, you really need to think about three layers of where you can look at sustainability, the investment process, the asset process, 
and the whole trading process. So the exchanges and all that. So I think when you look at that, when we look at it, we always try to make a holistic view. We try to add up the three layers. We try to not greenwash on the one side, but since we're an analytics company, we really want to um, have the data. We want to have a real-time overview. We want to know the implications in terms of CO2 emissions. Uh, we want transparency about the social and the governmental aspects. So when we, when we look at finance, we look at it from a analytical, rigor perspective trying to measure everything but across the three layers and that's something to me that's very very different to the ESG discussions that we have where people just try to create brochures on four um, color pages and try to um, you know make somebody believe that they're green. I think it was Elon Musk's 50th birthday yesterday did you share some of the analytics with him otherwise he you know again wakes up and realizes oh Bitcoin is using energy, right? So, well, I, I think um, Elon Musk has played a um, very special role this uh, past six months for the whole Bitcoin investment space. Um, but I would also not give him the credit of spending him too much time because I think one of the reasons why he even has that power is because people recite him all the time. So I choose to refrain from doing so. Yeah, I agree. Okay, there was one quick question in between, uh, and and because you mentioned, you know, the switch to to proof of stake, that's that's also important. Uh, which kind of blockchain are you personally using, and uh, you know, how do you see the importance of being, uh, let's say, fully interoperable going forward in in that space? Well, so I, I do think you can't ignore Bitcoin fully at this point in time. So we will generally try to um, have the, the larger blockchains in mind, but also with a, spe a spe specific focus on staking blockchain. So Colana, Cosmos, Polkadot, um, TSS and the others. In general, I think staking is a space that's even for blockchain um, standards quite nascent. So um, when you look at also deploying funds uh, such as our products, you can't disregard Bitcoin and you can't disregard um, Ethereum 1.0 at the moment. But we're certainly trying to push for Ethereum 2.0, so the change from proof of work to proof of stake as well. And in general, with our overall allocation, we're heavily over invested given the market capitalization of the blockchains in proof of stake. So we're trying to push this space as much as we can, given our um, investment allocation policies. But uh, let me say one thing, I think, and that's um, something that I would really um, like to focus about. There's something else about the proof of stake or let's say Bitcoin versus um, Ethereum blockchains that is quintessential to understand. Bitcoin is a monopurpose blockchain. You can transfer money from one place to the other, but the whole idea about using the blockchain as a world computer, as an um, internet token platform or internet-based token platform, I think that's really where the value is because the token concept in itself, that is such a critical concept to blockchain mass adoption in industrialization that I think it's um, also important that besides staking, the token approach is something that we focus on because really the token in the end is what I think from a commercial sense makes a lot of difference. Other than that, it will remain a finance product for most of that. But if you think about broadening the scope, then tokenization is the aspect um, that makes the difference. Let's use that you know, thought of tokenization and also staking and, and move forward. We discussed the E in, in ESG now. Um, so what about the social and the governance dimensions? Where do you see um, staking also playing a role there, uh, except for, you know, earning interest um, if, if you basically let your tokens work for you? Mm -hmm. um, so the whole decentralized finance space, which you were referencing to certainly uh, breaks barriers first and foremost, and it has an element of non-discrimination uh, non and also um, opening up opportunities to make money beyond the traditional finance structures, which certainly in itself is a way to go a general path down a more democratized and more liberal access. But I think that in itself isn't sufficient. Um, to me, when we look at the social aspects, you have different aspects that also come into play and maybe play a more vital role. 
So one is, um, again, the whole discussion about compliance, fraud, and um, anti-money laundering. And again, quite to the contrary, um, what most mainstream media will discuss, the whole idea that blockchains, um, in the plural sense, are being used mostly for money laundering is something that is just an awkward statement, given it's the most idiotic idea to use a blockchain i.e. an immutable record to mon uh, launder money. So when you look at the overall numbers, we have around two to five trillion US dollar annual volume of money laundering in the global established financial system. Now at the peak, the crypto market hit three trillion market capitalization, but we know that that is a number that hasn't, you know, not, isn't necessarily corresponding to the underlying transactions. So even by the magnitudes, you can see that um, the, the whole argument doesn't hold, but and also, and that's important, we have probably less than 1% of actual money laundered activities in the blockchain space, and then they're focused on the anonymous chains. So it is simply not true. Now, on the contrary, would you turn that around if we were to use blockchain-based payments, and that doesn't necessarily mean crypto, it could also be central bank digital currencies, if we were to use it, we could achieve two things that from a social aspect, I think are um, absolutely crucial. Number one, I've been on the record many times now saying if you actually want to prevent money laundering, you would need to introduce blockchain based payments across the industries and across the countries. That will be one of the most effective policies and levers we've ever had to combat money laundering and terrorist financing and everything that's associated with that. Because let's remember, those are fundamental crimes that then have money laundering as a second order effect. The second part, and that's also important, is when you look at transaction cost, when you look at um, you know, cross-border remittances, when you look at those that right now create big revenue pools from a banking perspective, and that really is something where you could argue that the social impact and the social benefit in saving transaction costs, saving fees for cross-border remittances is a global effect um, that would actually not only increase wealth um, on the global scale, but also you know, have a very strong social aspects because it's those that are actually depending on the remittances that are paying the fees as an extra text almost. So, I think in the all in the whole blockchain application, um, by reducing transaction costs, also increasing um, cybersecurity. By the way, you have a whole range of beneficial aspects on social. Questions on social before I go to government. Um, well, let me add something from from our experience. You know, some of our clients are. Um, or most of our clients are coming from, from let's say, various industries, uh, apart from the, the clients um, that Ritalin Code serves in the financial industry with, with all the backend systems. But many of these industrial clients are, um, let's say, preparing or even starting to push, let's say, circular economy models. So where um, the tokenization layer is, is serving as an incentivization scheme potentially, you know, to drive things. It could be recycling. It could be driving, you know, a, a different type of behavior if we talk about mobility. So I, I would count that as, you know, social as well. Uh, so to, 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 you know, marry what you said, you know, an efficient um, backend system with game theory and, you know, creating types of behavior that are, um, let's say, desired or wanted by society as a whole. Uh, because otherwise it will be hard to to you know, reach um, carbon reduction goals and, and all the other, let's say, challenging um, uh, themes and topics that are dominating the agenda, yeah, let's say, outside of, of, of the crisis mode. Um, but that is also, of course, closely linked to, to you know, governance. How do you structure, um, especially across company consortia, uh, if they need to collaborate to drive, you know, uh, these kind of circular economy structures. So that's where I also see a big role for um, for tokenization and for the use of tokens uh, to, to regulate governance. Uh, that's where staking comes again into play um, to control not only, you know, energy consumption, but also voting behaviors. So that's where I see uh, a bridge. I'm not sure if you agree and if you're 
professional reality, uh, you know, has different, let's say, focus areas right now? Well, um, as an opening statement on governance, I would say I would concur that the breadth um, of the application from blockchain uh, from a general uh, purpose point is massive in this space, massive and potentially even the biggest. Now, on the other hand, I think that's the hardest part to get it into the heads and minds of the decision makers and also the users, because that is an area where you have partially idealistic, um, partially also very you know, path determined um, structures that aren't really adaptive to change. If you look at you know, a hierarchical ministry, for example, you would find that there's almost no company or private institution in Germany, not even an endowment fund that is as hierarchical and as 1950s as any public authority. So I think the whole idea that you could um, improve there with blockchain across you know, almost all functions of government and thereby all functions of big corporates as well, because they tend to be a little bit similar, is massive. Now, what we're trying to achieve is that we come from the structural end, as in, look, blockchain is a little bit like a street network. You can build 100 meters here and 100 meters somewhere else, but the value of a street network is created when they're linked and when it's end to end. So the whole idea that, oh, let's find a small light um, a, a use case here and we'll, we'll use that as a pilot character and then the small use case here, I think is fundamentally a wrong um, approach. That, that couldn't be further from the truth, right? Because in the end, blockchain to me is an infrastructure. It simplifies things, it standardizes things, it makes it easier and cheaper. Those are massive, massive push arguments for the, um, for the tech. But if you only use one bit here and then it's disconnected to another piece over here, then you really don't yield the benefits. And that's true for a distribution um, a part of the business. That's true for a production line. That's true for tax evasion um, um, combats and all other bits and pieces where, you know, by bits and pieces, things pop up. Now, to me, we need to go to a much, much more fundamental level. First of all, we need to create an identity on the blockchain, an identity that isn't owned by a state or by a third party, but actually the entity holding the identity. That's a key parameter. If we had clear, identifiable identities on a blockchain network combined with a zero knowledge proof, we'd already be one big step ahead. Then the second part is you need to find a mode of interacting. How can I buy and sell? How can I rent or lend? And how can I start existing and end existing? If a blockchain network could have those fundamental functionalities and then also be combined with a mode of payment, you could decrease and simplify probably 60, 70% of all processes. You could you know, massively reduce transactions cost by either you know, being in default of payment or in default of delivery or interacting with the wrong party. All these things that make life um, complicated and business expensive, all that could be um, prevented and all that could be simplified. So I think we need to you know, be more bold and more visionary and see the fundamental value of the tech and not try to you know, do bits and pieces here and there because that doesn't really create all the value and is far, far short from the potential it has. So when we look at that, I think when we look about industrialization and tokenization combined, we really need to be as brave as, you know, the lawyers have been once they codified in Germany the, the commercial code or when they um, introduced other standards, you know, originally with, with the standardization organizations. That's where the value is. And I think that's what we need to focus on. In which direction do you think the the, the public, uh, let's say, decision maker level is heading right now? If 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 I'm in various you know hearings with at least the European um, institutions in Brussels, etc., I, I see a lot of people that are totally convinced by the benefits of blockchain mid to long term, and and they really want to make it happen. But then you know um, the next election campaign comes up, uh, and you see politician politicians making 
let's say uh, strange comments and 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 they might seem to not want to jump on on you know an innovation train that they don't fully understand in in already uncertain times uh, you know i don't want to comment about china their agenda is of course completely different but um, where do you see you know the the balance uh, you know coming up in in europe uh, I think it's 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 a cacoph um, cacophony where you need to pick your battles wherever you can. So in that sense, I'm somewhat opportunistic, quite contrary to my nature. So I will engage with any policymaker, any regulator, any central banker, any lawmaker on the federal, national, or even local level if need be. I will talk to technocrats, I will talk to Europeans, I will talk to international organizations wherever possible. I think one of my key challenges is if, if we want to prevent a regulatory framework that doesn't really understand the potential, then we need to educate those who are, you know, a bit and small piece in the puzzle on the potential and we need to make sure that those people are educated. And to them, it's one out of a zillion topics and you really need to make sure you've heard and you need to make sure that you come with a valid proposal and a bit of passion and energy. So I think to me, when I look where we started three years ago, when we first started you know, talking about it also in the media and in behind closed doors, at least now I would say people recognize to a large extent that blockchain is a thing. I think at least in some of the ministries, we now have working groups on it. We have days on it. Is that fast enough? Oh, no. Is that could that be more? Oh, yes. But still, I think it's almost also a second network effect where we need to build that. And I think we also and that's really critical. And that's something that a responsibility that I take very seriously we need to do our jobs well. We need to create jobs. We need to create business models that um, are profitable, that have a promise of productivity and that show the potential. Politicians in the end are really easy. Are you creating jobs? And are you, you know, having a good story of growth? And in the end, that's really what they want. And we're in a competition, right? We're in competition with AI, we're competition with other parts of, of let's say, future technologies, whether that be, you know, in the airspace mode or in others, in healthcare, in, in other techs. So, you know, in the end, if you want to have a good story and want to be heard, you need to deliver a good story first. So that's also something I think a lot of those that are, you know, claiming for the public um, uh, attention don't understand. So one of the things I really, really, um, you know, love about Redland Code is that you create so good, understandable, feasible, tangible use cases that really, you know, make that come true. And I think that's really the key. And we really need to push our industry in being successful. And then we'll also have the political attention that we need. Thanks for that kind kind remark about what we do. Um, and, you know, apart there, there are, of course, you know, many uh, opinions about how, how to best, um, you know, do that drilling that Max Weber described in his, you know, work ethics, you know, how, how you convince bureaucracies to move. But, um, you know, I can just um, make a, a side remark here for sure. You know, the European Union is, is trying the best they can, I think, to, to ramp up uh, a blockchain infrastructure. So there's a tender out or a project uh, about to be started to, uh, you know, uh, introduce a new version of the European blockchain services infrastructure. So we have many calls and hearings, so things are certainly moving. Maybe one last question before we hand over to, you know, one of these industrial projects that, you know, have been developed for more than two years. And, you know, in this case, we've been involved, but I think that's also what the space needs more of those projects that started you know after 2017 18 and that now took two years plus a, a corona overtime before they hit the market we will see more and more of those coming up and i hope that this will also shape uh, or help to shape the the public debate but if you talk to your financial investors you know uh, i i assume at least that most of them are coming to you because they you know want to to make money out of their money but apart from the, you know, the potentially promising and very interesting investment opportunity, uh, how do you, you know, convince them to um, to jump on board? Uh, is it this, you know, green financing discussion, or are you also telling them, look, 
you know, programmable money, the digital euro will come sooner or later. Uh, so better get, you know, used to a programmable and efficient way to structure what you're doing or, or which are the side stories that you are, you know, holding, holding high right now? Um. There are actually quite a few anecdotes that I'm sharing um, when I talk then to investors one on one, and I'm just contemplating one which one would be the best for this audience. I think one um, that I'm using very frequently is that um, to me tokens are like emails just 20 years later. So 20, 25 years ago, I remember my mother being like, I don't understand this email thing. I really like to send out hard, you know, handwritten letters and handwritten notes and you know, that never will have the same level of appreciation than an email. And the whole concept was awkward and people weren't used to the at sign and the whole thing. So where do I find this on the keyboard? So there were like, you know, little baby problems um, for an emergent technology. And I think today, I mean, of course, some, and I would also count me to that, still write handwritten notes, but certainly I do write many more emails. It's just easier, it's con you know, more convenient, it's faster and it improves communication. And tokens right now feel awkward. Um, they feel awkward to people and then you need a wallet and how do I do this? But in the end for the user, when you have you know, a smartphone or when you have other you know, um, user interfaces right now, you won't really notice that the backbone and the infrastructure will change to tokens and blockchains. Most of that will be even easier because all the awkward two-factor authentications and pins and tons that you now have will be actually easier again. Right now, I feel like online banking has you know, taken 10 years back because it's become such a nuisance to use it. So when we talk to investors, we really try to highlight the token economy, the advantages of tokens as a concept, that it will save the money when transacting and that it will increase the investment scope and also the investment transparency. I think that is something that people understand. I think, you know, we haven't had any major innovations in how we trade um, and settle equities in, in almost 40 years. So um, all overall that space is overdue to be disrupted. That's the one part. The other part is, we are in an emergence of a new type of tech and human interaction because we'll have machine to machine interaction that will be increasingly growing and that will be part also given our dem demographic sense of how we you know create um, products and how we take care of people and and you know and even if you have just a vacuum clean, uh, clean robot at home so we'll have more and more machines coming into our lives they need an identity too and you know you don't have human hand holding with machines so they need an identity they need a way to operate with other machines and to pay if need be so the whole um, technical development from the internet one point also the old internet to the tokenized blockchain based internet is something people also understand because they've come from paper really if you talk to also older investors they've still you know, had paper and then they had a digital share and they understand that that is, you know, somewhat um, inefficient and then there will be something new. So the overall line is clear. But lastly, and I think that's the most important point is cybersecurity is something a lot of people are significantly afraid of either because they've had, you know, some kind of ransomware or they um, have heard about hacks or others. So what is my property? What's my actual personal property if everything is digital? And the whole idea of the combination of cryptography and the mutable record and the transparency of a decentralized network when you talk through what would happen in some cases of emergency is something people understand quite quickly. So on the longer term, the advantages of the tech I think will make the difference and that you can create good businesses and create value on top of that is also something they understand in that uh, particular sense quite easily. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Katarina, for those insights. And, you know, to, you know, have this discussion uh, with me about, you know, what motivates you and what potentially motivates your investors and how to uh, explain that not only to them, but also to the broader public. Uh, I think it was a very, um, 
great um, discussion. Um, and what you said is certainly true. The question, what do I really own, is something that you know drives um, corporates uh, certainly as well. Uh, we we see the echoes in in the NFT discussions. I just had another call with a record label yesterday. You know, what what do we do with our music? Uh, you know, and how will ownership of, of digital assets evolve? Um, but now we want to jump to one, uh, let's say, industrial project. Um, and find out how big uh, corporations, in, in, in those case, one of our most important uh, partners and clients, Wien Energy, uh, Austria's largest um, energy company, has used tokenization and also blockchain technology um, to launch a project. Um, Chris, uh, my colleague and uh, CEO of Riddle and Code, will uh, certainly also share you know, some information about this project in a video. Uh, and I'm very glad to have uh, Sarah Mamel with us. Uh, she's, you know, coordinating uh, one of the, let's say, leading blockchain projects that we have in, in Germany as part of the uh, blockchain strategy of the German federal government, where we create a register for uh, energy producing assets. So she's more than, than competent uh, here to uh, do the second fireside chat uh, together with Chris. So welcome, Sarah, and over to you. Thanks a lot, Sebastian. It was a very interesting discussion that you just had. And um, yeah, so let's take this topic over to um, energy, energy tokenization, the energy system of the future. I think um, we're hearing these um, words a lot recently. And um, as you just explained a little bit, I'm responsible at the German Energy Agency for um, the, our first actual pilot project, the blockchain machine identity ledger, where we're trying to actually take a first step and um, build a potential infrastructure for this um, energy system of the future. And um, yes, as one of the use cases to actually showcase the potential of blockchain technology for the future energy system, we have chosen um, my power as um, so the, the project that um, Christian uh, will present you now as um, yeah, we see a huge potential in energy communities specifically. Um, so yeah, so I'm really looking forward to this uh, little exchange that we're going to have now with uh, Christian Haselwanter, the Chief Operating Officer of Riddle and & Code. And um, yeah, maybe to directly dive into it, um, Chris, um, let's grasp a little bit this topic of the energy system of the future. So in your opinion, why um, does it actually need new structures and technologies for um, the future energy industry in contrast to the status quo that we're having today? Um, thank you, Sarah. Hello to everyone who joins, uh, who had joined um, this event. Um, my name is Christian Haslund, I'm the CEO of Real and Code. For those who don't know Real and Code, we call ourselves a blockchain interface company. We have a strong focus on hardware and identity and uh, cryptography and blockchain technologies. And we develop applications for real life use cases. And one of these use cases is uh, the project that Sarah mentioned, the MyPower, that we will explain on what we did. And uh, it basically caters to all or most of the topics that had been discussed in the previous panel with um, Katharina and Sebastian. Um, now the question, uh, thank you very much. It's a really good question because we hear it all the time. Why actually does it need new technologies? I think energy is such an interesting thing. It's everywhere. It's the basis for everything. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons why we are able to talk now on the video conference is because we have electricity that powers our laptop powers the internet, et cetera. Still, energy is rarely a topic of discussions. It's simply, it's there. You know? And the reason why it's there is because the industry has um, built a very robust system over many, many different de decades to provide energy to consumers and to industries. Um, because it's a critical infrastructure, um, the companies who participate in providing the energy are regulated, strictly regulated by the government. They follow strict procedures. Um, but as a result of that, the entire energy market is centralized. Uh, what does that mean for me as a consumer? Centralized in the sense, all I can do 
is to basically decide which energy provider I'm signing a contract with. Yeah. And uh, that's all I can do. Yeah. Um, we see from, from the current developments in our world, and as a matter of fact, I think the climate crisis is another uh, expression of that. We will have to change the way we produce energy and also let alone the way we consume energy. And when we talk about change in the energy production, it means we have to not only to move away from the caloric or nuclear forms of energy production, but we have to adopt all these renewable energy forms in, uh, in the form of uh, wind energy, solar energy, etc. Now, the biggest change, although, and now I try to answer your question, why is new technology needed, is because we need to shift, to be able actually to cater to that transformation, we need to shift away from this centralized system to a decentralized system. And in the meantime, we have the technologies uh, to support such a move. And uh, that means, um, so far, we've only been consumers of energy, but in the future, each of us, every company, every community, they can be also be producers. Simply, for example, in the, in the smallest case, you just put a PV, a photovoltaic uh, panel on top of your roof, and you feed this energy into, into the grid. Why is that a big thing? Because so far, we had a lot of trust in the players because they were regulated. Now, if each and everyone can basically funnel energy into the grid, how do I know uh, who that person is, how do I know how much energy um, they provided, and how is invoicing actually, how does that work? You know? So I need a technology that um, excludes that these forms are tampered with and manipulated. And uh, again, here comes the technology with uh, the use of uh, the blockchain, the concept that Katarina mentioned in, in, in her presentation uh, of identity, and I'm talking about cryptographically secured immutable entities um, takes over uh, the security of these systems and uh, such a decentralized system can be built on top of it. And um, so we move away from, um, you know, all this, rut all this routine uh, that every year, once you get an invoice from your energy provider, and then you either have to pay extra money uh, uh, in comparison to the installment you made during the year, or you get some money back. In the future, it will be a lot, of, a lot more volatile. Um, and it's not only about paying money for the consumption and getting money for the production. It's all about the concept, also that was mentioned in the previous um, panel, about the concept of tokenization as a new form of currency in the energy industry. Yeah, I guess I fully agree with you on that. Um... And, uh, but tell me, is my power actually your first step in the energy market? Or have you done anything before in this yeah. industry sector? Mm -hmm. um, actually, we've come a long way. Already in 2018 it was. We had a, a first project with uh, EDP, which is uh, Energy uh, uh, de Portugal in Brazil. Uh, it was our first step into using this, this technology to allow decentralized um, uh, consumption and production so they had a different decentralized form of invoicing and that was our first step um, in a year later we started a project with uh, Wien Energy which is the largest energy provider in Austria and a partner of ours um, to run a project called peer-to-peer -peer. so that was for the first time where a limited community was able uh, to uh, use the energy produced in this uh, community through the solar panels and trade it between each other. So, for example, I have a panel and my share in this, uh, in this community is X and I'm on holiday so I can give and trade the energy with my neighbor who wants to power his Tesla car. So, that was the first time um, where we used um, also cryptography and the, the means of secure elements to prove the identities. Um, but it was just a second step. And to be honest, uh, energy is too cheap to be a big incentive to trade it. Yeah, it's, it's, so we really have to be an enthusiast. So we needed different uh, motivations and we need a different business model uh, to 
be able to make this transition uh, into uh, a decentralized world. And so I think now we're all very curious to see some details of the, of the use case of your project. And I think mm -hmm. you have prepared something for us. Yes, I think I have a very short video that makes it a little bit more tangible. Uh, what we did, I will explain the use case exactly after this video, but just as a teaser, I'd like to show. Let's see if, if that works very well. I hope you can see and hear it well. Yes. That video just was teasing uh, the overall project. Again, as I said, it was a collaboration with uh, Austria's largest energy provider, Wien Energy. Uh, uh, we were lucky to meet a very visionary team of managers who's, who tried out, uh, uh, who wants to try out this um, technology. Um, as a matter of fact, there's also regulatory uh, initiatives in order to enable and, 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 and create the frameworks uh, necessary for such kind of uh, technologies. Um, but the showcase that I want to explain today is the project MyPower. And um, what is different? What is the new, actually, the, the, the USB of, of such an implementation? First of all, as I said, the pure trading aspect of energy is okay. Yeah? But if you just use it in an isolated way, it is not a motivation big enough. Um, we see, although, a tremendous inclination and propensity towards um, the will to support renewable energy. Everybody understands that, yeah? And um, all of a sudden, when you have the chance, as I said, not to only consume energy, but to be a producer or support this, the form and influence the form of energy production, people are very happy to do so. So what we did uh, in Austria's largest uh, PV panel uh, plant, uh, we allowed people to buy shares. So you can buy a certain share in a local PV plant. You are owner of a certain share. Now that share is, is manifested uh, um, to an entity and is attested to the blockchain. Um, and then the amount, the, the, the PV plants that you hold a share of produces energy, let's say over the period of five to 10 years. And it produces energy in the form of kilowatt hours. And um, for each kilowatt hours that gets produced, you get an appropriate share in the form of tokens. So you get rewarded for your share over the full life cycle of such a, a plant. And um, the, the interesting thing is that you don't get it back in the form of money, but you get it back in the form of tokens. And as I said before, these tokens, they can uh, be used as a form of currency. That means you can use them, you can trade them, you can use them for different services. For example, either you get um, a discount on your energy uh, bill, or you use it in a supermarket, or you take a ride on the, on the subway, or you power your electric car with, uh, with an EV station. So there's lots of um, use cases that we can think of that um, stem from the fact that, that you have one universal form of token that we envision as a form of kilowatt hour token. Um, and that is exactly what this project does. Uh, just a side note, uh, just to show the interest of the public. Uh, within a few hours, I think all these shares were basically sold out. Uh, it was the second time we tried it out. So we can see that there's a lot of motivation in, in society to support these kind of uh, um, business models. Great, Jack. thanks. Thanks for this, for this um, interesting explanation. Maybe, I mean, you mentioned it already, but if you really would have to point out again the, the, the proper USPs and differences mm -hmm. between your um, my power use case and other projects. I mean, there are some in this energy community uh, sphere. So what would those USPs be? 
Yes, there's a few indeed. Um, first of all, uh, the underlying concept of, of uh, identity. No? It's represented by the crypto chip. So we uh, created a device that we call the trusted gateway that sits directly at the PV plant. What does it do? It creates an identity for this PV plant representing a physical object, in that case, the PV plant. And it signs uh, each and every kilowatt hour in the form of a transaction against a blockchain. So that means all these transactions, I don't need to wait for a company to send me a bill and telling me this is the amount of energy, but each and every one can directly look it up on the blockchain. It's, uh, we can see the transaction, they are immutable and, and not, uh, it cannot be manipulated. That's the first thing. The second thing is that I already mentioned is that you have the chance to participate uh, and, and, uh, in this production because you can buy shares. Um, and, and it's also a direct result basically of the financial service at the moment. If you have some money, what do you do with it? If it sits on a bank, you lose every day because you don't get interest. Most people have not enough money to buy a flat or anything else. So what do you do with the money? So investing it in, a, in an energy production plant where you have a lot of uh, higher redeems uh, seems to be an interesting thing. The third is, um, with Midland Code, we spent many, many years uh, to create uh, what we call a token management platform. So once you have the identities, once you have the tokens, you need a very robust system to, uh, uh, to manage these tokens, to secure the keys, the underlying keys uh, that represent these tokens, to be able to, to perform and sign transactions against not only main chains, but also settlement chains that we will see in the future. So um, we've come a long way in, in creating this uh, custody service, if you want, um, that is fully regulate, uh, regulatory compliant. So we have blessings from regulators uh, um, in, in Austria, in Switzerland, etc. So I think similar to the trust that we give to it, that we have towards centralized um, energy producers, this form of compliances hopefully creates the basis for trust in such a system without being owned by a central entity like Rhythm Code or Energy Provider. No, it's decentralized um, and it's secure. Um, and the third one is um, that we already implemented the concept of tokens. You know, the, the tokens that either represent a share, that represent the energy production, that are tradable. And um, I think if we think about tokens, we really must deviate from the pure concept of cryptocurrencies that uh, most of the time are on the basis of speculation. But in this case, the token is really packed to a real value of a physical object in the form of the PV plant, in the form of uh, the value of the energy produced. So, we will create and we have created a system of stable coins um, that avoids the volatility of cryptocurrencies. You know? Because if you talk to industries, if you talk to big players, they cannot deal with the huge fluctuations of these prices. So we need a different form and we believe uh, firmly that mis that concept will be catered to through the form of stable coins. Um, and last but not least, you can use these tokens uh, for different services and different utilities. So we believe end to end, um, we allow new forms of business models, we allow a higher flexibility, and we um, create the relevant trust in order to be compliant with the future regulatory provisions. Okay, thanks a lot. I see there are a lot of questions in the chat, but Sebastian is um, partially taking care of them and, and many of them have already been answered during the presentation. I think one question was asked regarding um, regulation, governments. I mean, we're seeing, of course, many governments now banning the technology and there was a question how, how um, the situation in Austria is, but maybe also from your um, experience now that you have been conducting this pilot project, um, what, what were the biggest challenges or obstacles so far in your experience? Um, I think the obstacles are, are, are two or threefold. One, and I believe the biggest obstacle uh, in the first place is a, 
a psychological barrier because uh, and I don't mean that disrespectful, but you talk to companies that have uh, uh, grown over decades uh, and they have a very centralized setting in their mind. And it's quite difficult um, to adopt a different mindset and open, open it up to new forms of technologies simply because you were trained to cater to these uh, strict regulatory provisions and it's all about security. So it's fair actually uh, that a lot of questions come up that uh, basically challenge the security of the overall technological stack uh, that is needed to provide uh, decentralized energy production. So psychological, psycho psychology is one thing. The second thing is certainly regulatory. I mean, we have strict regulations here and uh, it, it's not easy to uh, introduce new technologies um, because the regulatory frameworks do not fit these. So they were not made for that. So now, together with the regulators, we're trying to find um, ways to, uh, um, to be able actually to be secure enough, but not to kill innovation. And that was the second. And the third is, of course, um, also all forms of, of decentralization. So, so there's energy communities that try to do things. There is uh, private people who think in a certain way. So I think we all have to bring them together. And the, 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 the issue there is the interfaces between legacy system on a technology, technical area um, and the new technologies. So they, they work in a seamless way without uh, being a hurdle to each other. Thanks a lot. I think um, we could all see the huge potential of the project and also the, um, yes, I guess, long way we still all have to go, but I'm really looking forward of going it together. And um, as there also was a question uh, from the audience, like, what about Dana and Trudel on code for Germany? Any pilots ongoing like in Austria? Mm -hmm. um, so yes, definitely. There's currently the blockchain machine identity ledger ongoing which uh, will end in um, this autumn with first results. But um, there will be definitely a um, next pilot, like a blockchain machine identity ledger 2.0, where we will further move into the direction of use cases. And um, energy communities will definitely be also a topic that, that uh, we might explore there. And um, in general, the, Thanks a lot, Chris. And before I wrap up the session, so if any of the audience uh, come from um, energy companies or uh, companies of the digital sphere, you're very welcome to join our Future Energy Lab that is hosted by the German Energy Agency. And we bring different actors together to work on pilot projects and also elaborate new pilot projects together. But Thanks a lot again. And um, I pass the word to Sheraz Ahmed of Crypto Valley for the next chat. Thank you very much for having us. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah and Christian, for that really, uh, really insightful uh, panel uh, there. Um, so now, now we're going to move on uh, to the next panel, uh, how to prepare corporates, tokens, and programmable money. Uh, so, wow, it's, it's a lot to cover in 30 minutes, but... Uh, as we saw uh, yesterday from the game, uh, history can be made in 30 minutes. So let's uh, try to try to do the same. Um, so I, I will be your moderator uh, for this panel. Um, I'm representing both the Crypto Valley Association and Storm Partners. Uh, so I hold roles in both uh, implicated within the Swiss ecosystem. Uh, we're joined by uh, Heinz Gunter Lux, a digital strategist at Evonik Digital. Um, David Palmer, a blockchain lead IoT at Vodafone Business and uh, Sebastian Becker, CCO at Riddle & Code. So maybe we just start uh, this whole thing off uh, by a short round of introductions. And maybe, uh, Heinz Gunther, you'd like to start off by presenting yourself and how Evonik Digital is involved uh, within, within the blockchain space. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much, Amit. Um, my name is Heinz Gunther Lux, um, and I'm a digital strategist at Evonik. Um, I work in the chemical industry since more than 30 years. And uh, the interesting thing about the chemical industry is uh, that we are connected to any producing um, company worldwide. And, and um, when Katharina said think big, I think the chemical industry is the industry who thinks big. 
And when we develop uh, solutions and we can penetrate these solutions into the market, then uh, there's a game changer in place. And in fact, uh, we are working since quite a time on tracer technology, which enables uh, physical products, uh, physical objects to be traced and tracked in a blockchain. And when you do this, you can follow and can make use of it in the area of um, circular economy. Can, you can use it in a supply chain law. You can use it for a new diff, uh, business model in autonomous supply chain and so on and so on. And this is the scope uh, we are working in Evonik and we are already pretty far, uh, especially when we look into the, the money area where we use programmable money, for example, for a real use case. So short intro. <laughs> Great, thank you. I mean, a lot of interesting parts there that you mentioned, uh, supply chain, track and trace, programmable money, et cetera, but we'll, we'll get into that in, in a bit. Uh, maybe David, uh, you'd like to introduce yourself as well and, and uh, a little bit how Vodafone is implicated uh, in the space. Hi, um, yes, yeah, so, so I'm David Palmer. I'm the blockchain lead for uh, Vodafone Business IoT. Uh, I'm also um, leading a project, project called the Digital Asset Broker, um, which is about device um, economy of things, device identity, um, authentication and transaction. Um, but very interested in uh, the tokenization space. I've been looking at this for, uh, I think, the past blockchain for the past four years, tokenization uh, definitely for the last two years. Uh, interesting to see, uh, you yeah, know, interested to see the maturity that's come about um, and, and very much looking forward to this uh, timely discussion on, on tokenization in, in corporate enterprise. Great, amazing, thanks. And, and last but not least, uh, Sebastian, I mean, the, the audience knows you uh, rather well already, I'm sure, and, and really doesn't uh, quote at this point. So maybe you'd like to give just a, a brief intro to yourself and then, and then we can dive straight in and, and start things off uh, discussing the, the infrastructure that's now in place uh, to help large corporations, uh, such as Vodafone, for example, uh, that can better transition into this world. Sure, thanks, uh, Shira. So, Sebastian Becker, I'm the Chief Commercial Officer at Riddle & Code, and I think, you know, Chris took the opportunity to, to introduce us a little bit. Um, we pride ourselves to, to call ourselves or be called the Blockchain Interface Company, and this also puts us in a position where we a, need to educate the markets because, you know, the, the, the aspect of how to connect physical objects to blockchains is, of course, not, you know, in, in the f focus of, of many discussions, uh, let's say, outside of, of the industries. And it also you know, puts us in touch with, uh, you know, many interesting people out there like, like David and, and Heinz Günther. Uh, so we hope to be able to contribute to, um, let's say, the end-to-end -end solution. Um, I myself am, am based in Munich, uh, so co commuting uh, if we don't have a lockdown between Munich and Vienna, where I am right now at our headquarters. And um, I'm, I'm not the foremost, let's say, technology person. That's why I have a lot of colleagues internally uh, working, uh, you know, to, to turn visions into reality. Um, but I'm more um, the guy to, you know, look at the business development opportunities and uh, try to align, let's say, what we can offer with um, the, the requests and the needs of, of our various partners. Wonderful. Uh, thank, thank you so much, um, Sebastian. Then, then maybe we, we, we kick things off uh, straight, uh, straight there and you can tell us more about that uh, business side uh, now and, and how, how the infrastructure has really been put in place uh, now, now within this space and, uh, and where we're at. Maybe you can give us a little bit of w where we're at. Yeah, sure. I, I think, you know, if we look at this um, panel today or the webinar today, um, this structure, you know, of course we put it in place uh, intentionally, but, you know, it, it, it says a few things. So um, regardless of where, you know, projects or companies came from, Riddle & Code started with, let's say, IoT technology in mind end of 2016 uh, we were also you know then slowly but surely being sucked into uh, the adoption of blockchain technology in, in the financial sector you know that's the industry that had first had to take care about uh, a new uh, asset class that was in the market so we need uh, regulatory compliant and uh, highly secure and efficient technologies to trade crypto. Uh, so that has become in the meantime our main business line, but we haven't given up uh, our, let's say, IoT uh, focus. And, and that's, I think, where, where we can make a difference because, you know, we, most of us also hopefully in the audience might have heard of the Oracle problem. So a blockchain is highly secure, but how do you make sure that 
you know, data sets that are coming from, from the outside um, are, let's say, to be trusted. You know, we, we, we all saw it from the US presidential elections, how, how difficult something, you know, can be, even if it don't, even if it seems to be so easy and somebody just take, you know, an election result and, and types it into, uh, you know, um, a data management system, but sometimes it's, it's not so easy. And especially if we connect the physical layers, be it in supply chains or uh, over the counter situations to a settlement layer, uh, then, or hopefully then all the CFOs wake up and say, look, you know, if, if we have cheated data sets, then this affects my bottom line. So what can we do to prevent it? Uh, it's already a shame that an industry like the automotive industry can live with, you know, 30% odometer fraud, um, but that's of course, you know, quite easily to understand. It doesn't affect the aftermarket or the secondary car sales market, uh, their main business model. So that's why everybody can live with it. And we as consumers, you know, pay the bill uh, in the end. Uh, and, you know, you can continue like that. There, there has been fraud with energy meters. Uh, there's certainly, certainly a lot of efficiency in supply chains. Uh, and also, you know, mobile phones, um, David's, you know, one of David's main areas of interest uh, also have their security issues. Uh, so I think that it's very relevant what Katarina said uh, also in the first panel, cybersecurity has to be taken care of. We need more efficiency and we need a tokenization or incentive layer to, to, to steer things in the right direction. And sometimes that can be a consortium in the chemical industry. Uh, or it can be consumer facing, since most of things that Vodafone do are consumer facing. Um, so tokens uh, are a very universal token, meaning instrument, um, to, to reach these goals. And uh, hopefully we can deliver it in a, in a highly secure and end-to-end -end secured way. Um, well, thank you. I mean, you, you touched on a lot of a uh, lot of points. So we will have time to discuss a few of them in further detail. But, but, but maybe we, 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 we touch on what um, you've been doing, uh, Heinz Scooter, and, and what uh, you've been doing at uh, Evonik, which you know it's it's quite uh, inspiring. And, and really, what struck me was uh, the kind of tagline: "We contribute the small things to make a big difference." Right. And my question to to what actually Sebastian was saying is. To your belief, is blockchain a small innovation? Because at the end of the day, I mean, it's, it's quite simple. Uh, that will make a big difference or is it just a catalyst for further innovation on, on top of it? No, so basically the blockchain technology has put a different view on data uh, because in the old days, always systems were protected. And we know systems cannot be protected. Whether we talk about cloud, whether we talk about uh, um, other ways, only if you have your computer in your office and it's not connected to anything, then you are safe. So, but now with the blockchain, we protect data. Data on the, on the source of the, of, the, of the data. And the, the Oracle problem is a challenge because that's the only point where data can be manipulated. But other than that, the data can be trusted. And the data are uh, encrypted and can be uh, shown to everybody who has an access right to them. And this makes a complete difference to anything what we think about data management uh, overall. And the other part is, um, I'm pretty sure in next year, there is no object anymore which has not a digital representation or digital twin. So then you can manage data and uh, product in a completely different way than that what we, what we do today. So with the certificates, with the discussions, with everything what, what's related to that. So these are the big differences. The data are the center of the blockchain and they are protected from the data source of it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Data is practically the center of the world now uh, as well, right? I mean, um, great. And so, uh, David, I mean, we, we've spoken uh, together quite a bit actually over the past couple of months about Vodafone's proof of concepts, using blockchain as online technology. I mean, uh, how game changing do you see its potential in the use cases that not only you're putting forward into the world, but, but all, all the others are around? Um, so, so, so I'll start off with blockchain and um, yeah, we, we say, okay, blockchain is trust. But if you look at the majority of the processes that we, we, we undergo individually or as organizations, a lot of the processes and the checks and the balances are, are based on a lack of trust. So for example, you go to the airport, um, you know, uh, you present your dry, you, you present your passport and you're presenting your passport because, um, you know, that you need to prove who you are. 
you know, you, 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 you then present it again uh, when you leave, you present it uh, when you arrive, you, you use it as, uh, as authentication and other things. And, and you just look at the processing and the resources that are used um, you know, to, 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 to mitigate that trust. And, and then you see the meaning of blockchain because um, you know, blockchain offering a trust um, where uh, for companies um, you can, you can extend, extend that automation boundary uh, to others um, it has huge uh, potential to uh, increase automation and efficiencies. Um, and with the Internet of Things, um, as Sebastian mentioned, um, you know, the Internet of Things, I mean, we're, we're very big on the Internet of Things. I think we've got 130 billion connected devices. Um, but, but there's one fact, right? Um, you know, a lot of the data or the significant amount of data from devices aren't used and, and devices um, are, 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 are to an extent siloed. So the information from devices are um, essentially um, coming from, uh, you know, going, going back to base. They're not, they're, they're not spanning cross organization. And blockchain has the potential to bring that together. It has the potential um, to be a trust anchor that will allow um, devices or people or business models um, associated with one industry, one company, uh, to speak to business models, um, devices, people um, from, from other, uh, from, from other um, companies, uh, regions, et cetera, by providing that trust anchor layer. So, so, so I think the potential... Um, to revolutionize business it, it is very real. Uh, and I think we're starting to see that uh, to an extent spurred on by COVID, the COVID passport, I think, uh, or vaccine passport is a, is a good example of, of that starting to happen. But I think the, the sheer monetary incentive um, to, to, to increase efficiency, uh, to, 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 to have more streamlined and automated processes um, it is key. Um, I think the other, um, the, the other side of it is tokenization. And um, you know, tokenization uh, essentially adds a medium of exchange to that. So where you have parties that trust each other, um, essentially, how, how do you capitalize on that? So if you have two devices that trust each other and one has data that the other one wants, how do you, um, how, how do you then facilitate the transaction between that? And that's where tokenization, digital identity, and blockchain uh, start to come into play to facilitate that. And you know, for, for blockchain to really um, take off, I mean, I think if we look at the statistics, Blockchain is probably 0.01% utilized, right? And a lot of that is crypto. But for it to really gain adoption uh, in, in industry, it's going to be linked to the bottom line. It's not going to be sort of technical, te te technically um, beautiful use cases. It's going to be about where business leaders and enterprises see the chance um, to either improve current business or get new business. Um, and, and they're seeing an opportunity. Um, so, so, so that's my sort of you know, initial thinking on those two things. Um, but but uh, yeah, in short, uh, I, I see um, that blockchain has um, a significant potential to uh, impact uh, business. And uh, in, in times where things are lean and, and uh, technology is uh, reducing barriers to industry uh, or barriers to ent uh, entry in a number of industries, uh, it, 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 it's going to play a key role over the next uh, five years, in my view. Thank you, and, and we'll explore a little, a little bit later what we can do to actually uh, go, go that step further uh, to, towards uh, adoption. But uh, but before we do that, I mean, you you, you touched upon on trust, uh, Hans, because you trust uh, you you touched upon uh, data, right? And I think these these two elements go go quite well with programmable money, right? And one of the topics of, of our discussion. I mean, uh, Sebastian, maybe you can give us uh, some insights. I mean, what, what what do you expect from programmable money? Um, yeah, speak to us a little bit about that. Yeah, I think it will become a, a main driver for, let's say, the mass adoption, because right now, if we talk to big companies, and there are, of course, notable examples such as uh, Evonik, where we really see, uh, you know, a broad understanding of, of um, the benefits of blockchain technology, maybe also because their their early POCs were, were well framed. Uh, so they were eager to show results early on. Uh, so that certainly helps. But, uh, you know, many um, business units out there that deal with um, blockchain technology. And I, I think that's at least what I can observe from, from European and also U.S. companies. That's true. Um, they are lacking a coherent strategy around it. So oftentimes units are, you know, making themselves busy for a year or so. And, and then they do not successfully break through with an internal presentation of results. So the board is not really incentivized enough to, to look at it, to fully understand the 360 degree perspectives that blockchain is offering. And then there is no real adoption of 
I wouldn't call it blockchain strategy, but we need a coherent innovation strategy. Um, and I think we heard about the, the various benefits that blockchains are bringing. Uh, but for sure, as soon as blockchain technology is used to to drive, you know, programmable money, the digital euro or the digital yuan, then everybody will wake up uh, and and understand, you know, if we cannot efficiently program our industrial services, then we will be doomed rather quickly because the efficiency gains are high. So the introduction of programmable money will not be, you know, an iterative iterative piece of innovation that leads to efficiency gains of, I don't know, 0.5%. So there will be a relatively quick effect, uh, especially for companies that have international business uh, and others that are in their niches. They also will need to uh, think about, you know, how can I now collaborate with my partner companies, with my, you know, uh, companies in my proximity or even competitors because blockchain is crying for collaboration. You know, it's, it's, it's IoT. Uh, times programmability, uh, times uh, security. Um, so everything is there and there's no excuse anymore, basically. Yeah, I, thank you. I mean, um, and, and, and Heinz Gutter, I know that you've been involved in, in, in a lot of uh, subjects around programmable money. Would you, would you like to comment a little bit on, on what uh, Sebastian just, just mentioned? Yeah, first of all, um, why have we started with uh, this programmable money case um, in, the, in the blockchain area? And um, Always one of the challenges is if you have a traditional company working with a technology which is in the press more negative um, than, than positive, uh, then you need to start in a way that you can convince people with a completely different way of, of working. And the lucky thing is that together with BASF um, and Commerce Bank, we had the chance to discuss a, a specific process between Evonik and, and BASF, and this is because the chemical industry is connected um, I would say all over the world because we are supplier and, and customer. And, and we said we have so much inter interactions uh, between the companies and they are, um, let's say, as, um, processed in a, in a traditional form. And this was, uh, um, traditional form is very time consuming for people. And as David has rightly said, um, there's a lot of control mechanism, not only here from, from the, 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 the airport, but it's also internally in the company. And he said, how can we change the process? Because it's a regular process, always on and on the same process. How can we make it different um, using the blockchain technology, smart contract, and then connect it to, to the financial area? Why the financial area? Because everybody's affected by the finance area. Um, on one side, blockchain is hijacked by the finance area. On the other side, it's a good opportunity. And that's what we did. We looked into um, the real euro that it was reducing the hurdle of acceptance within uh, managers in Evonik because financial managers hate complexity. Um, so we started in, in thinking in, in the euro, euro. Commerce Bank brought in their, their ideas about the programmable euro here. And then we, we developed a process of an existing business which is done since, I don't know, 100 years. So the, the uh, invoice verification process and we connected it uh, into two wallets from BSF and Evonik uh, run by, by a Commerce Bank or established by Commerce Bank. And then we, we fully integrated the process without having a bank account anymore in between, without having a, a, um, a, a invoice verification process of people anymore. The only challenge is to have real good data on both sides. So we say mirror image uh, data we need in the system. And then the things are running smooth. And we were very successful. We ran uh, more than uh, almost 3 million euro in six weeks. Um, a press release is out there. And that was the, the opening in the mind of people to think this is more than only blockchain and, and Bitcoin. And if we link that more in area where we say we can connect physical objects to that process, and then we are there. And therefore, we work on the autonomous supply chains where we say there's even more mechanical or let's say manual work of people done in the process, but always in the same way. If we put that now in a smart contract, we can even go further with the automation part. And uh, between BSF and one of two powerful companies, when we do something, people are looking. And I think this is an important uh, part um, of the success story of, of our use cases uh, when we work here um, on, on blockchain um, in, in the area of industry. 
No, no, very, very well said. You know, I really like the analogy of opening the mind, right? You're, you're opening it uh, towards it. And, and so now that uh, our minds have been opened, uh, D- David, how, how do we really kind of uh, get, go that extra mile, get to that adoption and even close the gaps uh, that, that, that might be there? Yeah, I mean, I'll start off by by by, by saying that um, yeah, in terms of pro, pro, programmable money, there's sort of three elements. So, so we discuss blockchain, which is the trust. Um, you know, we we discuss tokenization, which is the sort of medium of exchange uh, for transactions, and and obviously smart contracts provides the the logic for that. Um, but 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 there's also something else which is transforming, which is wallets. And um, I, I sort of said this before, but but I, but I see a world where uh, you'll have organization wallets, you'll have wallets for your devices, you'll have wallets for, for people uh, who are connected to that. And, um, you know, to have programmable money, that is also uh, a very important transformation that needs to have uh, happen. And you associate your wallets to smart contracts, you can associate your devices and their transactions to smart contracts. And then you start having, um, the, you know, the, 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 the landscape or the preconditions for programmable money to start impacting some of the stuff we're doing. Uh, in real industry, one of the examples could be supply chain and, and basing um, you know, transactions within a supply chain based on data from IoT devices, et cetera. But the wallet and this transi- transition away from bank accounts or, or bills to, to uh, people, businesses and things, having a wallet, I think, is a transition that, that, that is important. Um, in terms of adoption, um, as I said, 0.01% uh, in this world is starting to get a lot of attention, uh, a lot of that in crypto. Uh, but a lot of the adoption comes with making blockchain and, and, and the, the, the apps uh, associated with blockchain easy to access. Um, and, and a lot of um, you know, sort of our thinking on that is, okay, you know, from an IoT perspective with billions of devices, um, you know, on cellular networks and on IoT platforms, how can you easily, um, you know, get, uh, people and devices, um, you know, who already have uh, phones and, uh, you know, already connected to IoT platforms, connected to the blockchain. And um, that's something we've been working on. Um, but, I, but I think, uh, you know, not trying to push Vodafone or what we're doing, but I think leveraging existing um, ecosystems and existing technologies um, you know, with blockchain is the way forward. So, 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 so I often say that, uh, you know, this is a evolution, not a revolution. Uh, it may be a techno- technological uh, revolution, but in terms of adoption, it's going to be an evolution. And, and you do that by, um, by, by bringing in some of the existing technology. So uh, one of the questions I ask is, why can a smart contract not work on real money as well as digital money? Um, you know, why, um, why, why, why can I not... Um, you know, access a blockchain through my phone, right, or, or, or directly from my device. Um, you know, these are key things that drive adoption. Um, and um, I, I think solving some of these problems and proving them will be important as we go on, uh, as we go on to, to achieving real, real uh, adoption. I mean, you only have to uh, look at a MetaMask wallet and try and, um, you know, try, try, try and exchange tokens on it and you realize the friction and the, techno- <laughs> and the technical know-how that's needed. And, and, and you know, we, we almost need, need what Jobs did for the iPhone and, and using apps on it to happen for blockchain. And, and I know there are some real cool projects looking at that, but that is going to be what's important. That's for consumer and for business. Great. Well, I'm really glad that you, you touched on, on that uh, collaborative uh, side. It kind of loops really well back in to what Sebastian was, say, was saying at, at the very beginning. Um, I am cognizant uh, of time as well. Um, uh, as a nerd, would, would you like to take questions from uh, the, the audience uh, now? or? Um, yeah, if you close your session, I would be happy um, to start the Q&A. Oh, it, was, it was wonderful. I think I think short and sweet. We we touched on a lot of a uh, lot of different points. I think thank you so much uh, for for the conversation. I think well, the conversation continues now with with the audience. So um, all all yours. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, let, let me make one one final remark, if it's allowed. Yes. Um, as David said, it's very important to to make the public and the industry aware of the properties and of the of the opportunity with blockchain on one side and. To make them aware of the challenges we are facing. Um, we have published just last week a book, uh, sorry it's only German available, it's about blockchain and the, the economy in, in a real break uh, situation. It will be published end of August also in an in, uh, audio book uh, in English, but here we covered really those topics um, which we discussed from, from the political, from the financial, from the IT, from the, from the challenge between um, uh, China and, and US and from the point of real, what is the, the, the driver 
of blockchain technology, as I've explained it here. This is our way, how we want to make um, the great, greater public aware of this ongoing change and the solution potential uh, blockchain is providing. Thanks for that, Heinz. Uh, great uh, that you took the time to, to put this book together. Um, you know, uh, as I understood it, it was supported. Uh, uh, to a certain extent by Vonik, but you did it, let's say, in your in your private life as well and spent a lot of time. So grateful for that kind of know-how transfer um, and hopefully people still buy books and, and use them, but putting it out as a as an audio, audio book is certainly great. Uh, I have one question. Is that a deep purple NFT in the frame behind you or is it just a normal, you know, cover? You mean by the book? No, at the wall behind you, is it a deep purple NFT LP cover or is it just a traditional one still? It's a real traditional one, a vinyl, and, and it's in, in a nice frame. It was the first album I loved uh, and I was the age of seven or eight at that time. So I still love it. <laughs> That's why I think the next webinar should be on insurance technology and blockchain. You know, when that casino in Montreux was burned down to the ground, yeah, uh, you know, we couldn't retrieve all the data. So blockchain can, can also save a lot of in, uh, insurance cases. But over to you, um, Eichner, you wanted to give us some questions from the audience. Sorry um, for that excursion. <laughs> Sebastian. Um, well, yeah, I want to open up the Q&A session now and want to give the opportunity to everybody get into the game. Um, I just actually have written down the questions came in, but um, I want to start with the question. I think that was for Katarina. Uh, Katarina, when you were talking about the tokenization, where do you see the biggest challenges uh, in this area? Would you like to share some, some inputs about that? Well, the problem is, of course, Katarina um, couldn't stay with us um, for all the session. So we, we can for sure, you know, send it to her uh, and then she, she uh, can come back about that. But I, I hope that we covered, you know, some of the issues around it um, in the panel and also in the fireside chats. I, I think what Heinz mentioned right now is, is of course, of, of utmost importance, you know. Um, it doesn't help if we have every week a webinar where, where the believers are talking to each other. So we have to spread the word. So publishing books, you know, giving presentations, um, putting out, uh, you know, pieces and blogs on websites. That's that's certainly the way forward. And also we, we have to increase the efforts, I think, in in various lobby organizations. That's where um, Katarina, that's what I know, spends a lot of time. You know, you, you have to preach to the, the, the not yet converted uh, decision makers out there. And uh, Shiraz, I, I think that's also what you are doing uh, with the Crypto Valley Association, right? Yes. Um, Okay, more questions? Um, yes, yeah, Sebastian, I think you already covered that in your discussion with Katarina, but uh, maybe you would like to add some more inputs about that. What is the current situation, uh, status of the tokenization regula regulation across European Union? Uh, well, I think we, we have to differentiate between security tokens where we still have a market-to-market -market approach and, and it's totally clear and understandable that A, regulation will let's say, hit the markets and that there cannot be big exemptions for, let's say, the digital asset industry. So it will have to somehow smoothly fit in with existing regulations in the security space. In the utility area, and that's maybe for industrial tokenization, a very important one. Um, we are all waiting for MICA. So that's the, let's say, draft regulation that is out there on a European level to be discussed and adopted. We assume this will take place in the second half of 2022. So until then, you know, full-fledged lobbying is, is still a possibility. Uh, and coming back to um, the presentation that Chris has given about uh, the MyPower project with Wien Energy, there we have two tokens, you know, one tokens that uh, regulates, let's say, uh, shared ownership in, in photovoltaics assets, sort of physical installations. And then we have the kilowatt hour token, which is designed as a utility token. That's why it has limited use. So you can re redeem it with a selected number of, of companies right now here in Vienna. But of course, this, this project uh, will also be exported to other areas of Austria first, and we will most likely within six months see it on various continents. Um, so discussions are underway. 
Um, so that means, you know, in the utility tokens area, which might drive a lot of tokenization in the industrial space, you have to get familiar with um, the current, uh, let's say, draft situation that we have in Europe. There will most likely be passporting for utility tokens because it's a new field in Europe. Um, but it will be interesting, of course, to see how elections and, you know, international policies or politics will, will influence decision making here. But it's clear that Europe might still be leading on a on the tech front, but is certainly not leading at the adoption front right now, and that should be worrying to all of us. Thank you, Sebastian. Maybe you or Chris would like to talk about how we tackle the taxation aspect of the tokenization uh, when the transactions are happening between the, between the token holders. Chris, Chris, one for you, maybe. Um, yeah, that is a very good question, actually, uh, because as a matter of fact. In fact, if you, for example, buy a share in a PV plant that establishes ownership, yeah? so we will see uh, that in the future, certainly, it's a, basically a security in an asset that we expect to be taxed in exactly the same way that we know from standard financial um, assets. Um, when it comes to uh, trading, it's a little bit difficult. As, as you know, for cryptocurrencies, uh, we have different regulations in different jurisdictions. Uh, most of these jurisdictions say, well, it doesn't really matter where you make your money. Uh, as soon as you have an, an income, you have to tax it accordingly. The problem, there's, there's certain, uh, for example, in Austria and other regulations, there's 12 months of grace period. So if you, if you don't realize your profits within 12 months, uh, it's tax free. Um, but uh, we will see how then that, that pans out. Um, it, it, it is also has to do with how do you actually establish that form of income, for example, in the form of, a, a, um, of an ownership. Um, and, and we said that the concept to do that is the identity and the identity is brought to buy crypto chips. As a matter of fact, in current regulation, uh, in many, you are not allowed to add um, a secure element that contains a crypto chip to a smart meter that meshes uh, all of the production. So there's a lot of things that have to come together. And frankly, we do not know uh, what the final outcome will be. And that's, that adds another uncertainty to the development um, in that area. But maybe we should um, differentiate here between, let's say, regulation that will, you know, set boundaries, for example, in the financial space and evolving regulation like, you know, smart meter certification that will for sure for the next generation also allow incorporation of uh, crypto chips. That's what we are working on in, in the DINA BIMIL project right now. Um, so there's also, let's say, positive trends if we talk about regulation that new technologies are finding their ways into the next round of things. Thank you, Chris and Sebastian. Um, there was an, another question to Heinz Gunther. Um, how uh, your project works from the regulatory side, uh, for instance, with the custody? Would you like to share your experience about that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, first of all, um, the discussion is always uh, people want to get, get out the banks, uh, but the banks have an important role, and the role is to make sure that the regulatory uh, KYC, know your customer, AML, anti money laundry, is, is covered. And this is a, is a legal um, thing we have to follow, and, uh, and the industrial users definitely have to follow that. Now, we decided to use uh, here a Commerce Bank because they have the idea and the knowledge how to incorporate in this process of uh, exchanging money between the wallets um, and to make sure that the AML and the KYC, for example, is followed. This is a part uh, which, which Commerce Bank uh, brought in here. And um, this is, I think, definitely an important uh, area as long as these rules have to be followed, because in the vision, I can imagine that these rules do not have to fo be followed anymore because everything is, is uh, recorded and, and documented on the blockchain. So we even don't need any more KYCs if the identity is clear, but currently we need to follow this this way. And therefore it was for us important that Commerce Bank has, has solutions to, to develop um, yeah, as this, this point. 
Thank you. And we also got an interesting question about the 5G. Uh, with the onset of 5G and the benefits of blockchain brought about by various communication service providers, several use cases came to mind, um, including development of digital identities, swifter dispatch resolutions, and many more. Um, where do some of the leading CSPs feel positioned this year and early next year in the adaptation of blockchain? So would you like to, would you like to share some some ideas about that? Yeah, so, so I think, uh, f f well, I think, but 5G is incredibly exciting. Uh, I mean, from a, from a connectivity point of view, it's, it's faster, low la latency um, technology uh, for the internet of things and, and, and uh, use cases around the internet of things and blockchain. Um, this opens up a lot of, um, uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of possibilities uh, to, 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 to have um, use cases and solutions that we didn't have before. Uh, in, in terms of the rollout of 5G, I think that's well publicized. Um, so, so, so there is a, a, a sort of well-known roadmap to get that out into into key areas as soon as possible, which has already started. Um, things like autonomous driving, where you need low 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 latency, um, sort of fits nicely into um, you know the the the, the work um, that Sebastian was talking about in terms of device identities or identity for. Um, uh, identities for a car and uh, transactions on tolls and parking and EV charging, um, which uh, which are exciting things that also fit in the context of some of the um, the, the the initiatives by our governments um, to to uh, increase the adoption of EVs and renewable energy, etc. So, um, I think 5G will play a key role in that. Uh, it's a key enabler, and um, yeah, we we spoke many times in the past about uh, the 5G, IoT and blockchain. Um, and I think, yeah, 5G now coming on stream uh, is, is good timing for some of the, the, the sort of use cases that, um, that, 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 that will now be possible. Thank you, David. Um, I think we covered most of the questions. Um, if there's any question that I left out, please make sure to come back to me or, or our speakers on LinkedIn. We will also share with you um, our speakers' uh, contact information via email. Um, and um, Alexandra, I want to hand over to you for the final words. Okay, thank you Aisinu and all the speakers for the wonderful event today. The recording of the video will be sent to all participants in the next few days and I hope you enjoy the event. Um, we are going to host another webinar with video and quote speakers in September. So make sure to tune in our social media channels and newsletter. Um, that is from my side and I'm looking forward to see you soon. Bye.